we will start with the pres first presentation that is on quality of life and its related factors among patients with stroke in selected tertiary care hospitals in Sri Lanka. Uh, the authors are L K M E W S M U L L E P O L A K N Nadisha E R A I Jayavikrama W M A I Vijay Sundar R D N Karuna Tilaka and M M P T Jayasekara. Uh, they are from the the nursing and midwifery department of the Allied Health Science Faculty, General Surgeon Kotalawal Defense University, and the Clinical Science Department, Faculty of Medicine, General Surgeon Kotalawal Defense University. The paper will be presented by L K M E W S M U L E P O L A. Over to you. And we'll move on to the next uh, presentation. The next presentation is on an exp exploration of mother's experience of children with thalassemia depending on iron chelation therapy in thalassemia center of provincial general hospital Badulla. Uh, the authors are NHT Dool, DMS Shant, WMDNK Vijay Sekara, KMTD Abhayavadana, CDMP Karuna Tilaka and BSS De Silva. And uh, the study was conducted at uh, Pro Provincial General Hospital Badulla and also Department of Nursing, the Open University of Sri Lanka, Nugegoda. The paper will be presented by Tanya Dool. Over to you, Tanya. So unable to share my document. So so unable to share my document. Go ahead. If we can see the slides now, you may start the presentation. Yes. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tanya Dol from Open University of Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share our research findings with all at the KDYRC. Our research topic is an exploration of mother's experiences of children with thalassemia depending on iron chelation therapy. Thalassemia Center of Provincial General Hospital in Badula. More to the introduction. Thalassemia is a genetic disorder which unable to produce sufficient amount of hemoglobin. So these patients require to regular blood transfusion, and regular blood transfusion leads to iron overload in major body organs. To overcome these problems, these patients need to iron chelation therapy. Iron chelation therapy is uh, using special drugs for removal excess iron from the body. Mothers are main provider of iron chelation drugs to thalassemia children. So when attending to view iron chelation drugs, mothers faced multiple challenges such as uncooperativeness of their children and fear to insert desperate injections like that. Considering all these issues, mothers' experience are most important to provide iron chelation therapy effectively for their children. Move to our background slide. Let's see mother situation in developing and developed country. When considering situation about Greece, mothers are suffering from emotional distress and fear to death regarding their children. And move to the situation of Iran. 
most of mothers worry about their children's high iron level likewise they are they have problem with insertion of iron chelation drugs when we talk about our neighbor country in india they stress about upbringing their children with poor physical and psychological outcome to owing to the thalassemia disease but in sri lankan concept i don't have mothers experiences because of lack of studies in sri lankan cities therefore this study will help to identify the multiple experiences faced by mothers when caring their children literature review site many studies were conducted in international context related to our research topic these studies concern about mothers physical psychological and social economical experiences when considering mother psychological experiences a descriptive study in india were pointed out stress anxiety depression anger and guilt feelings of mothers when caring their children and when talk about mothers physical experiences another descriptive study so pointed out fatigue insomnia are most common physical problems among mothers in italy as mother socio economical experiences many studies were pointed out mother suffered from financial problems lack of social and professional support and lack of so poor acceptance for their children so overall literature was concluded mother physical psychological and socio economical problems directly associated to quality of treatment process of their children let's see why we are conducting these studies previously i told that mothers are main provider of iron chelation drugs and they faced multiple challenges when care when providing quality treatment these problems leads to ineffective use of iron chelation drugs because of this reason child's serum ferritin level gradually become increased and excess iron deposition there are major body organs and it leads to occur many complications such uh, namely iron related complications such as hepatic cirrhosis diabetic mellitus hypothyroidism heart failure therefore mothers always worry about managing iron overload related complications of their children that's why we are conducting this study keeping all this information in our mind the research process has been designed to focus us on the following objectives our main objective is to explore the mothers experiences of their children with thalassemia depending on iron chelation therapy in pgh badulla specific objectives are to identify mothers physical experiences and to identify mothers psychological experiences and to identify mothers socio economical experiences we will move to the methodology part qualitative research approach used to conduct this study research design is phenomenological design this study was take place at thalassemia center in provincial general hospital badulla purpose is sampling method were used and target population is 12 mothers having children with thalassemia and at least 2 years experience of caring their children data were collected through semi structured face to face interview and data were analyzed using thematic analytic method and also ethical approval was obtained from ethical review committee of national hospital sri lanka let's see most important part of our research study is the result we divided result to themes and sub themes these are our themes and sub themes we will discuss these themes and sub themes one by one in next slides our first theme is fear and worry it also categorized into three sub themes caring tension financial worries and uncertain about child future most of mothers have <coughs> worry about insertion desteral injection and one mother narrated her feeling when i try to pick her my hand is trembling i am sweating so i leave out to giving desteral now her iron level is very high and other most important psychological burden is unaffordable cost of bone marrow transplant surgery 
bone marrow transplant surgery is the only option to cure thalassemia in children but cost of bone marrow transplant surgery is unaffordable to family members in thalassemia children likewise they suffer from child's body may changes and also they fear about untimely death of their children our second team is good service for cure it also divided into three categories effective treatment good care from the hospital staff and deficiency of health information most of mothers have two or more children with thalassemia so they have to share one desperate machine with all siblings one mother narrated her difficulties like this i have four children two of them are suffering from thalassemia we had two desperate machines but now one is not working properly so i give them desperate one so twice week because of the shortage of desperate machine sometimes mothers keep to giving desperate to their children and when considering substance of good care from hospital staff mothers always accept family hospital environment and friendly health care providers but they faced many difficulties to find information regarding disease condition and treatment for this because most of mothers have poor education or background even someone can't read or write therefore mothers complain about deficiency of health information our third team is give support for safe our children it also divided into three sub teams unity of family members governmental support and voluntary organizational support mother most of them have good family support when caring their children but mothers complain regarding poor governmental contribution for bone marrow transplant surgery one mother narrated her feeling bone marrow transplant surgery is the only option to cure our child it is costly we are poor people my husband try to get money from the presidential fund and moreover they seek volunteer organizational support for facilitate new desperate machine and repair their broken desperate machine in the last team neglect others and self care they <coughs> because of attending child care in process they have neglected themselves one mother narrated her difficulties i am a diabetic patient depending on insulin actually i have no proper meal no sleep and no rest when i hospitalized with my child sometimes i missed my insulin dose likewise some mothers neglect to get treatment for their chronic diseases such as diabetic mellitus hypertension and gastritis and also they fail to maintain good social relationship due to busy work schedule with their children now to the discussion part of our study considering all about result mothers faced many physical psychological and social economic problems when considering mothers physical burden mothers worry about child uncooperativeness with treatment continuous education they are untimely their body image changes like this likewise the similar findings of point found among mothers of thalassemia children from research study in jordan iran india and pakistan when we discussed mothers physical problems they suffer from sleeping pattern disturbance fatigue gastritis and personal hygienic problems and the same situation were pointed out studies in india as mothers socio economic problems they complain that shortage of desperate machine high expenses of bone marrow transplant surgery and restriction of family and social bonds and poor social acceptance for their children mothers in thailand iran and hong kong also face same situation like sri lanka conclusion of our study this study revealed that mothers face multiple challenges in caring their children such as lack of self confidence and disappointment due to senses of their children future lack of self care sad emotion of their children likewise and also mothers seek assistance from their immediate family members and health care provider and society likewise mothers lack of awareness of disease condition and treatment process leads to unnecessary anxiety and fear regarding their children to solve all these problems we suggested to increase public awareness regarding thalassemia disease 
and we can arrange trips, performing some celebration in special days, dedicating post clothes and toys to improve psychological status of mothers and children. Further, mothers should be introduced. Volunteer organization for facilitate and repair their best wearer machine. These are some references that are used to conduct this study. Thank you very much. The paper is now open for discussion. If anyone has questions uh, to ask from uh, uh, Tanya, uh, can ask now. Ms. Tanya. Yes, yes, Tanya. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Yes. Uh, how did you uh, maintain the trustworthiness of your research as it was a qualitative study? I I was used member checking and okay. interview interview at least between forty five to sixty minutes and and also I was used external observer and the result of this research shared with other mothers having child with thalassemia to examine similarity between research findings and their experiences. Okay, how did you think uh, to stop uh, data collecting at the fair participant? Uh, we collected the uh, data collection until the data saturation point reached. Uh, okay, you, you could mention that. Thank you. Uh, in addition, uh, I think uh, I must congratulate you and your team Morning, yeah. on uh, on very uh, uh, studying and important topic because these are things that we don't normally consider uh, in when managing a patient uh, but we, we have to consider what is around uh, the, the the problem per se uh, about uh, the caregivers and their issues that they face now uh, so uh, I must congratulate uh, on that regard. Uh, now, uh, now bone marrow transplantation uh, is not done uh, widely or at all in, in, in our country, uh, to my knowledge, especially in the, in the uh, government sector. And uh, I know that it is the definitive treatment for major thalassemia uh, or thalassemia major, uh, but uh, do we normally discuss that option at all with the with the patients because uh, when it is not available that the, the usual management is uh, whenever the blood transfusions are necessary to give blood transfusions and also support them socially and, and, and educate them and also iron chelation therapy uh, do we normally, as yeah. uh, in the in the in the hospitals, do we normally discuss that with the patient? Uh, yes, sir. Most of them are very poor, so they couldn't find money for bone marrow transplant surgery. That is the reason for. No, that, that is what I am saying now. Do we offer that down if they have money? Has anyone got this? treatment done in Sri Lanka? Uh, I think sir, one or two children done this surgery in Sri Lanka. Uh, but I think uh, it also unsuccessful some surgery. Uh, therefore, they went to undergo surgery to go by India, go to the India. Yeah, even, even going to another country and get it done yes. has not happened maybe in a uh, other than a case or two in our country yeah. so because we have a lot of uh, thalassemia patients yeah. now aren't we giving uh, by discussing these options which are very expensive and not available are we increasing the distress of the the families because yeah. they know they can't find out money and we don't have that facility in our country uh, and 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 so on. Yeah. 
so that is a question i i, I just uh, thought uh, considering someone find some money from presidential fund and uh, voluntary organization uh, and other, uh, other most important burden is uh, they have not suitable donor yeah so, so what, uh, what you have to realize is there are a lot of not only the money there are a lot of obstacles uh, to get this treatment so yes when it is not so is available readily we we should not discuss those options with the patient and the yes. families that is what yes. i think as a clinician yes okay okay with that note shall we move on to the next presentation uh, and thank you very much uh, tanya for your excellent presentation yes, sir. and uh, it was very nicely organized uh, study i would say the next presentation uh, how was the first one ready so we will start go on to the first one which we couldn't uh, continue that is on quality of life and its related factors among patients with stroke in selected tertiary care hospitals in sri lanka uh, i i uh, told you about the authors and the, the place so this will be presented by l k m e w s m u l a pole over to you Are you there? Are you there, Miss Ellipole? Yes, sir. Sir, still I can't share my document, sir. Okay. To be given the authority. Okay, yeah. uh, I think uh, someone from here should contact uh, and see what is happening. And give the technical support to uh, Ms. Ellipole. But while we are doing that, we will move on to the next presentation. That is on assessment of treatment adherence, behaviors, and the predictors among patients receiving hemodialysis. in kurunagal teaching hospital sri lanka the authors are t l c lasantika j k p vaniga surya u p k hetti arachi a a t d amarasekara and c s c gunawardena and uh, they are from uh, the department of nursing and midwifery uh, faculty of allied health sciences university of sri jayawardenapura Center for Kidney Research, Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, Department of Biochemistry, Faculty of Medical Sciences, uh, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, and Faculty of Community Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. So, uh, several departments of Sri Jayawardenepura uh, University is involved. The, the paper is presented by T. L. C. Lasantika. O. T. U. Lasantika. Thank you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, KDU IRC, for this opportunity. Uh, today, I am here to, uh, to present the findings of the study titled "Assessment of Treatment Adherence Behaviors and Their Predictors." among patients receiving hemodialysis in kurunagal teaching hospital sri lanka 
Let's start the presentation by introducing myself. I'm TLC Lathandika, a postgraduate student, Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. In this presentation, I would like to speak about background and significance of the study, research aim, methodology, more importantly, the findings of What happened? Lasantika, can you hear us? Uh, So what we will do is, uh, because there is a connection problem, we will play the backup uh, of that presentation. So uh, at the end, if possible, we will ask some questions uh, from Prasantika. Uh, So can you all play that now? to uh, play the gentlemen i'm here today of the presentation now yeah okay to present the research findings of the study titled assessment of treatment adherence behaviors and their predictors among patients receiving hemodialysis in kurunagala teaching hospital sri lanka let's start the presentation by introducing myself i'm tlc lasantika a postgraduate student faculty of graduate studies university of sri chaiwadanapura in this presentation, I would like to speak about background and significance of the study, research aim, methodology, more importantly, the findings of the study, and finally, the conclusion and recommendations. End-stage renal disease is one of the major public health concerns in the world, as well as in Sri Lanka, which reports substantial number of diagnosed patients daily. According to the statistics, chronic kidney disease has been affected around 10% of the global population and contributes to 5 to 10 million annual deaths with the diagnosis of end-stage renal disease. Patients with end-stage renal disease are treated with renal replacement therapy. 
Even though kidney transplantation is the best treatment option available, most of the patients receive hemodialysis as the more affordable renal replacement therapy due to limited availability of kidney donors and financial constraints. Hemodialysis treatment only is insufficient to maintain quality of life of the patients with end-stage renal disease. It requires success of whole hemodialysis therapy, which depends on various types of treatment modalities, including hemodialysis attendance, prescribed medications, recommended diet, and fluid restrictions. Even though healthcare team fosters adherence, success of hemodialysis therapy may depend on patients' understanding and motivation to follow aforementioned treatment modalities. According to the literature, around 50% of the patients diagnosed with end-stage renal disease are non-adherent to their prescribed hemodialysis therapy, causing increased morbidity and mortality among them. Why this study is significant? Along with increased prevalence of chronic kidney disease in the world as well as in Sri Lanka, the number of patients who need renal replacement therapy have also been increased. It was reported that the number of patients receiving renal replacement therapy have been increased more than 1.4 million worldwide in 2020. According to the statistics of National Hospital of Sri Lanka in 2015, there were around 1,000 dialysis sessions per month carried out for the patients with end-stage renal disease. On the other hand, patient adherence to treatment regime is crucial to maintain their quality of life. In fact, better adherence reduces the huge financial burden caused by the treatment to the patients, their families, and also to the healthcare system of the country. Therefore, it is a timely need to assess the level of patients' contribution for success of their own hemodialysis therapy. Since the limited scientific evidence available on this research area of interest, the current study aims to assess selected treatment adherence behaviors and their predictors among patients receiving hemodialysis in Kurunagara Teaching Hospital, Sri Lanka. When it comes to methodology, this descriptive cross-sectional study was conducted in Teaching Hospital, Kurunagara. The study population was diagnosed patients with end-stage renal disease receiving hemodialysis. Patients who were receiving regular hemodialysis at least for six months and patients over the age of 18 years were recruited for the current study after obtaining their written and verbal informed consent. Sampling method was convenient sampling and the sample size was 150 patients receiving hemodialysis. Data collection instruments were validated end-stage renal disease adherence questionnaire and self-designed disease-specific tool to determine associated factors for treatment adherence behaviors among patients receiving hemodialysis. A scoring system provided with original end-stage renal disease adherence questionnaire was used to determine the level of self-reported adherence to hemodialysis treatment among study participants. Data analysis was performed using IBM SPSS version 25 software. The findings of the study were presented by means of descriptive statistics and correlation between categorical variables were analyzed with Spearman correlation coefficient. The significance levels were predetermined at p value less than 0.05. Ethical approval for the study was obtained from the Ethics Review Committee, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, and from Committee of Ethics Review on Scientific Research, Teaching Hospital, Kurunagala. Let's see the findings of the study. As you see in Table 1, majority of the study group consisted of males and were belonged to 41 to 60 year category. Majority were single is married, belong to nuclear family, and were not engaging in an occupation. Around half of the study participants educated up to ordinary level and had monthly income of the family less than 10,000 rupees. The clinical profiles of the study participants showed majority of the patients were diagnosed to have chronic kidney disease for less than five years and were receiving hemodialysis less than one year. Almost all the patients were having one to two dialysis sessions per week with four hour duration. In Table 3, you can see the mean adherence score for various treatment modalities of hemodialysis therapy. Out of four treatment modalities that I mentioned earlier, 
higher percentage of patients showed adherence to prescribed medications with the percentage of 96.7, whereas considerably low percentage of patients showed adherence to fluid restrictions with the percentage of 32.7. As you see in the table four, overall adherence to hemodialysis therapy was assessed based on total adherence score yielded from the sum of scores of the items directly measuring adherence behavior of the end-stage renal disease adherence questionnaire. Based on the results, around half of the study participants showed overall good adherence to hemodialysis therapy, while around 45% of participants showed moderate adherence. Figure 1 further illustrates the same finding of the overall self-reported adherence towards hemodialysis therapy among study participants. Pursued importance of adherence to four treatment modalities of hemodialysis therapy was further analyzed. As you see in the table 5, more than 90% of the study participants believe that adherence to all four treatment modalities are highly or very important. Perception of importance of taking medications as prescribed was showed among highest percentage of studied patients. Figure 2 shows overall perception of importance towards hemodialysis therapy among patients receiving hemodialysis. As you see in the figure 2, around 89% of patients had good overall perception towards hemodialysis therapy. As you see in the table 6, Significant positive correlations were observed between self-reported adherence and overall perception of importance towards hemodialysis therapy, currently engaging in an occupation, higher monthly income, and being able to afford monthly expenditure for treatments. Significant negative correlation was found between self-reported adherence and forgetfulness to receive treatments among study participants. The data given in the table 7 compare the findings of the current study with the findings of two other studies that have been done recently in Rwanda and Palestine using same data collection instrument in stage renal disease adherence questionnaire. As you can see, the percentages of overall self-reported adherence to hemodialysis therapy of the current study are aligned with the findings of the previous studies given in the table. All three studies, including current study, concluded that only around 50% of the study participants were having good adherence to hemodialysis therapy. As a conclusion, the findings of current study showed the overall adherence to hemodialysis therapy was partially satisfactory among patients receiving hemodialysis in teaching hospital Kurunagala, whereas adherence to fluid restriction was considerably poor. It is strongly recommended to conduct future studies with the larger sample size to identify the magnitude of non-adherence among patients receiving hemodialysis. Further, measures should be implemented to improve treatment adherence among patients, thereby to enhance the quality of hemodialysis therapy. These are the references that we used for current study. Finally, we would greatly acknowledge research grants of University of Sri Jayawardenepura for financial assistance for the current study and for all the patients who participated in the study. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Rasantika. I just want to check whether you are online for a discussion. Are you there? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you. Could you unmute your mic, please? Uh, yes, yes, okay. sir. Now I can hear you, sir. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Now the paper is open for discussion. Any questions uh, you can ask now? Ms. Talani, thank yes, you for the excellent presentation. Uh, what are your recommendations? Uh, recommendations were, madam, uh, one thing, the patients uh, who were receiving hemodialysis in Kurunagala teaching hospitals, they, they were uh, not having good uh, adherence to fluid restriction. So uh, we have to uh, create some uh, maybe... Uh, uh, 
educational intervention to in, enhance their adherence to hem, uh, fluid restrictions of hemodialysis therapy and also uh, the future studies uh, should conduct with large sample size uh, to determine the magnitude of non-adherence among patients uh, receiving hemodialysis in Sri Lanka because our study had the small sample size that was a uh, sample but I think uh, we can uh, use with the, uh, we can conduct a lot uh, future studies with a large sample then we can uh, have uh, more uh, accurate uh, information finding then uh, we can generalize it uh, into a uh, uh, population of the country and we, as well as uh, we can uh, conduct study uh, in a, uh, in multi center as a multi center study because this is a single center study then uh, we can improve uh, generalizability as well okay any specific reason to uh, select your study set in Kurunagal? Uh, actually, Madam, uh, Kurunagala Teaching Hospital is well established dialysis unit uh, uh, out of the Colombo. And uh, actually, uh, the patients who are attending hemodialysis in the Kurunagala Teaching Hospital, they have uh, different backgrounds. The, there are a uh, variety of the patients. That means, uh, uh, on, uh, now, North, North, when we consider North Central province, uh, there are a majority of the patients who are having uh, chronic kidney disease in unknown origin. But in Kurunagala Teaching Hospital, there are patients who are with uh, unknown, unknown, uh, chronic, chronic kidney disease in unknown origin as well as diabetes mellitus, hypertension, so on. So uh, therefore, I selected Kurunagala Teaching Hospital as my uh, study setting for this study. Okay. Okay, one more question. Now, uh... I think, uh, first of all, I must say that it is another very important area that you have studied, like the previous uh, presentation, because uh, uh, in, as clinicians uh, in the hospitals, we used to treat the condition, but we never st study and, and, and try to find out details of what is, what are the other things that are associated with this, yeah. when the treatment is not give, properly given. Uh, my question is now, uh, there are four aspects of the treatment. And uh, as you said that the income and the, the employability and all that can affect. Yes. But some of these things, uh, the income and all are not relevant because you know, like water restriction, for example, can, can, can has nothing to do with the, the person's income. And also uh, adhering to medications and water restriction can be done better by a person who is not employed and, and, and staying at home. How do you explain these things? Uh, yes, sir. actually the fluid restrictions and uh, dietary recommendations, yes, they, uh, when, when we take it separately, uh, patient can uh, adhere those components uh, when, they, uh, when they are in the, at the home. But uh, I think uh, regarding hemodialysis attendance, uh, especially the hemodialysis attendants and uh, having prescribed medications uh, because uh, they the patients told that uh, they don't have enough income then uh, they can't uh, have uh, transport facilities to come to the hospital because uh, many of the patients are in uh, far away from the hospital not uh, from the kurunagala uh, hospital area so uh, they has to uh, they have to reach hospital uh, with the, uh, they have to uh, spend a lot of cost for that. So, uh, yes, I think uh, regarding transport facilities and uh, with uh, the uh, expenditure for treatments, uh, especially for the medications, they need money. They have to have good income for that, as they said. Uh, so I think uh, that is the reason for that, sir. Okay, thank you. I, but still, I think what the fluid restriction has nothing to do with any of these, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Fluid restrictions, actually, uh, the problem with the fluid restriction is they can't adhere for that because uh, uh, the recommended fluid amount uh, was actually 500 milliliter per day. Sir. So it is very uh, little amount that they can't uh, 
tolerate uh, for a day. So uh, they told that uh, even they can't uh, eat uh, with that small amount of fluid. So I think the money and income, uh, there is no job with the uh, fluid restrictions and dietary recommendations. Uh, but with the hemodialysis attendance and uh, prescribed medications, uh, there is a uh, good association. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we will move on to the next presentation. The next presentation is thank on you, rela sir. relationship between hypothyroidism and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease among patients attending the endocrine clinic, Palambo South Teaching Hospital, Sri Lanka. The investigators are H. A. Kodikar, E. M. C. B. Ekanayaka, K. K. N. Sevandi, I. S. W. Ponnamperuma, W. A. Apa, U. Bulugahapitiya, and J. M. K. B. Jayasekara. And the study has been conducted at the uh, Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, General Surgery and Potalavala Defense University, Radiology Unit, Columbus South Teaching Hospital, and Diabetes and Endocrine Unit, Columbus South Teaching Hospital. So this is a collaborative study between the KDU and Sri Jawadhanapura uh, uh, Teaching Hospital. Uh, sorry, the Columbus South Teaching Hospital. And the presentation will be done by H.A. Kodikara. Over to you for presentation now. Thank you, sir. So it's going to be a recorded version again. So we'll start it now. Okay, now the presenter is going to present now. Uh, presentation will be done by H.A. Kodikar. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chairperson, Professor Amma Vijay Singh, Board of Judges, guest ladies and gentlemen, and my dear colleague. I am Hassan Amanda Kodikar from the Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences, FHS KDU. So I am here to present our research on behalf of my research team on the topic, relationship between hypothyroidism and al alcoholic fat liver disease among the patients attending the endocrinology clinic, Columbus South Teaching Hospital, Sri Lanka. First, let's have a look on the introduction of the study. So, an alcoholic fat disease, accumulation of excess fat in the liver, mainly without alcohol, mainly without alcohol overconsumption and genetic predisposition. Hypothyroidism is an associated disease. We can divide hypothyroidism as subclinical hypothyroidism and overt hypothyroidism. In subclinical hypothyroidism, TSH levels increase with a normal free T4 level and in overt hypothyroidism, TSH level increase along with the lower T4 level. When considering the uh, relationship between those two conditions, thyroid hormone can reduce the cholesterol and Tg level by regulating the lipid metabolism. This is done by the thyroid hormone receptor beta in the liver. So in hypothyroidism, thyroid hormones is decreased so that the cholesterol, Tg, LD, L levels are increased. We referred many articles and found out that the incidence of hypothyroidism is high hypothyroidism in NFLD. But we could not find any evidences in Sri Lanka regarding this topic. So our main reason of selecting the topic as our research was to in hypothyroidism and non-fat liver disease in Sri Lanka. Then uh, these are our objectives. As you can see, our general objective is to identify the relationship between hypothyroidism and NFLD. 
and there are four other specific objectives. These are them. So this is the method we followed in our study. First, uh, we went to the Columbus Teaching Hospital and present our uh, research proposal to the consultant endocrinologist. And after discussing with him, we submitted our proposal to the ethical committee of Columbus Teaching Hospital and we obtained the we carried our research according to the following method. So we selected 37 hypothyroid patients according to our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So after selecting the patients, we obtained the written consent from the each participants and we gave them a questionnaire and collected their data uh, including their family history, clinical history, and social demographic data. Then, uh, three milliliters of blood were collected for the biochemical investigations. Uh, they are TSH, PT4, lipid profile, HDLT, and gamma GD. After that, the ultrasound scan was performed on each participant to diagnose the fat liver disease. This is done by the consultant radiologist of the hospital. Finally, uh, we analyzed the data we collected using the SPSS software. We used independent sample t-test, PSA and correlation test, chi-square test, and regression analysis. When considering the results, according to the descriptive statistics, 62% of the study population were diagnosed as having NAFLD. This is the main outcome of our study. Another main fact that 97% of the study population were females and 62% of the study population were in the middle age. According to the results we obtained through the uh, comparisons, we use the independent sample D test for this. Uh, as you can see, uh, age, BMI, triglyceride, uh, SDLT, gamma, GD, these parameters became significant between non-alcoholic fat liver disease patients, between non-NFLD non patients and NFLD patients. And also, gamma, GD level become significant when compared between subclinical and overt hypothyroid patients. Uh, uh, so uh, we got some uh, significant values, but uh, our main focus is to found a correlation between TSH and T4 levels with repeat profiles and liver function tests. But unfortunately, we could not find a uh, significant correlation between them. When we move on to the association, uh, we use the chi-square test for this. Uh, the age with fat liver status and BMI with fat liver status became significantly associated, significantly associated under the chi-square test. So finally, uh, let me interpret the conclusion of the study. According to the distributed statistics, incidence of hypothyroidism among non alcoholic fat liver disease patients were 62%. Uh, but uh, TSH and T4 levels between uh, FL, NFLD patients and non NFLD patients are not statistically significant. And also, uh, no significant associations were found between subclinical and overt hypothyroid categories with NFLD patients and non NFLD patients. So, as a conclusion, even though even though descriptive statistics shows a uh, coincidence between hypothyroidism and NFLD, there were no statistical significant relationship between. Uh, throughout the study, uh, we have identified some limitations. The very first one we had we had faced was the COVID nineteen pandemic. It resulted in very low sample size and we had to face many difficulties throughout the research. And also our exclusion criteria was a bit tough. Uh, even it was also resulted in an even smaller sample size. 
ഫാക്കൽറ്റി <laughs> so it's very easy to transport our uh, to transport the samples to the faculty uh, that's why we selected the kalabod hospital as our research thank you and one more question uh, in addition to the proposed recommendations you said uh, do the study in a normal day or like that in addition to those things uh, can you give some kind of recommendation Uh, based on your study findings you um, can give any can you give any recommendation based on your study findings did you get my point uh, no madam then in, in your recommendation slide go to your recommendation slide if you can right so, no slide number 12 me right so increasing the sample size conducting the research at a more ordinary time period in addition to these two can you give any recommendation based on your available findings uh yes madam uh, in our uh, study 97% of the uh sari population were females uh, so if uh, if we conduct our research uh, uh, using both the both uh, genders uh, and increasing sample size uh, increasing sample size uh, will be will give more accurate results okay right. thank you very much okay um, thank you odikar uh, congratulate uh, for your presentation uh, can i ask you one thing uh, do you know the prevalence of uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease in the community uh, so in sri lanka yes uh, yes sir uh, it about 30 to 40% in sri lanka 30 to 40% yeah. now i think what yes uh, sir but as it could have been better if you could compare this with the normal population and see whether the hypothyroid patients have a higher prevalence of non alcoholic fatty liver disease in order to do that you have to find a, a control group of uh, yes, age and gender so age and gender match control group who are you thyroid who has no yes. thyroid function and and do the same testing on them and find out the prevalence and compare with this group then it's a very good finding yes and, uh, and also we have to clearly indicate what is the test or what is the criteria you use to diagnose non alcoholic fatty liver disease because there are several different and uh, uh, there, there, there are several diagnostic criteria even ultrasound scan has different yes. ways of doing it like there is a, a thing called fiber scan and we have to elaborate yes. what type of scanning you did and and there and in, according to the scanning you can even grade non alcoholic fatty liver disease to grade 1 2 and 3 and, and and score so all these have to be mentioned 
and if you can do that this would have been a, a, a very useful uh, study so with that remark i think uh, in the absence of other questions we will move on to the next presentation and thank you so much for your presentation thank you so thank you sir Okay, we will move on to the next, uh, the last presentation uh, because uh, the, the next presentation presenter is not available online. The, the last scheduled presentation will be a counseling intervention to improve treatment adherence to ischemic heart disease patients. The development of a protocol. Done by UGC Kumar, ETD Soisa, A Balasuriya, and NFJ Fernando. And they are all uh, investigators from uh, Kotlawala Defense University, from both the Light Health Science faculty and the medical faculty. The presentation will be done by WGC Kumar. Over to you, Kumar. Honorable Chairperson, uh, Dr. Namal Ijesingha, and Honorable uh, Panel of Judges, Dr. Tamara Amar Sekara and uh, Dr. Lalta Migoda, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear colleagues. Uh, today we are going to uh, present our research findings uh, on the title, uh, A Counseling Intervention to Improve Treatment Adherence of Ischemic Heart Disease Patients, uh, the Development of a uh, Protocol. So let's uh, move into the contents of our study. So we'll uh, move on to the uh, contents as uh, introduction, justification, methodology, results and discussion, conclusions and recommendations and uh, references. So according to the annual health statistics uh, in 2019, in Sri Lanka, ischemic heart disease has become the leading cause of mortality. So enhancing the physical adherence, uh, the dietary adherence and medication adherence, would enhance the overall adherence to the treatment of IHD patients, which would directly enhance the health benefits of the patient. So uh, to enhance this treatment adherence comprised of physical adherence and dietary adherence and medication adherence, the patients with IHD need a behavioral change. So to this, this uh, behavioral change, the self-management of ischemic heart disease should be empowered within them according to the prescribed treatment from the hospital. So uh, the self-efficacy and the self-regulation are the key concepts that would enhance the self-management of the disease and motivational interviewing is the best counseling approach, which is mostly recommended to enhance it. So therefore, uh, we thought of uh, cross-culturally acceptable counseling intervention, which includes motivational interviewing approach to enhance the adherence among these patients. 
so currently there's no such uh, established psychological intervention to ensure the physical activity dietary adherence and medication adherence among the patients with IHD in Sri Lanka. So such an intervention would be a useful tool for the health practitioners working in the area of uh, IHD in Sri Lanka. So ultimately the aim of study was to develop such a socially, culturally acceptable psychological intervention for improving adherence to physical activity, diet and medication in patients with IHD in selected hospitals in Gaul district. So we have created, we have produced this protocol uh, to uh, inculcate within hospitals to be uh, trained with the help of uh, health education nurses. So let's move into the methodology of this uh, study. So uh, we would uh, like to share this methodology within three uh, segments. First one is content of the protocol. The uh, second one is the second, uh, the Delphi expert review. Uh, and the thirdly, the ethical consideration. So let's move into the content of the protocol. So the content of the protocol uh, was consisted of uh, two uh, uh, categories. First one was the assessment part. So assessment part was developed based on the self-regulation model by Leventhal and Steele and, uh, and the brief illness perception questionnaire. So uh, there were two subsections in this assessment, right? So this assessment on uh, the uh, patient's knowledge on ISD was assessed in the first section. So in that, uh, the nurses were trained, uh, the discussions were made, uh, how to do the ident uh, assess the knowledge on the patients on ident identity, cause, timeline, and consequence, and cure, and control of the IHD. And secondly, regarding the perceptions, making sense of IHD symptoms, assessing the health risk, determine patients' actions regarding the symptoms of IHD. So there, we uh, discussed thoroughly on the making the sense of symptoms, how to make the symptoms of that, and symptoms available, and symptoms frequency, and uh, assessing the health risk, and how to determine the action. So the second part of the protocol uh, was the intervention part. So this intervention was carried out within uh, four segments, that is uh, on communication skills, motivation and interviewing, goal setting and problem solving. So the communication skill, in communication skills segment, we discussed thoroughly how to do the uh, communication skills in verbal and nonverbal methods. In motivational interviewing, we uh, developed this protocol uh, and we have, uh, we wanted to train uh, these uh, health education nurses under these five central principles, DS, it's called as developing discrepancy, expressing empathy, and amplifying ambience of the patients and rolling with their resistance and enhancing the self efficacy. So, in the third part, in the goal setting, uh, we were thought of uh, introducing how to set goals, generating change options, and arriving at a plan, uh, listening to commitment, staying committed, committed, and also to smart goals. So, in the fourth segment, that's problem solving of these patients. That is problem identification, listing solution, and uh, selecting the best solution and implementing of the chosen solution with the patient and evaluating the improvement of the selected solution. So let's move into the second segment of this methodology, that is the Delphi review. So each section and subsection of the protocol was reviewed by an expert, expert panel uh, consisting of a consultant physician, two experienced clinical psychologists, and a nursing director at a national level, also a nursing educator and also a nurse in charge of a health education in a base hospital, also a trainer of the nursing, uh, nurse uh, education nurses. So uh, health education nurses. So each section and subsection were raised, ra rated on a scale of zero to nine on the, this uh, criteria. So this criteria consisted of the usefulness to improve the treatment adherence of patient with IHD and appropriate to be used with the patients with IHD cross-cultural relevance to be used in Sri Lanka and whether it is understood by the nurses who would implement the intervention. So expert comments are obtained on any change to be each and subsection or section and expert ratings were analyzed using Scott and Black's three point categories, one to three, four to six and seven to nine. So this each section and subsection was removed or revised if 70% of more of the ratings were in the category zero to three and kept as the same if the 74% of more than the ratings were categories in four or above. So the Delphi rating received by, from the each uh, stage. Uh, firstly, stage one was evaluated and then we sent them, resent to a second round and the re-ratings were re-evaluated for the degree of consensus. So content of the protocol was revised based on the comments received from the expertise. 
So uh, when we consider the ethical considerations of this study, so actually this was a part of uh, my PhD study. So this ethical approval for the study was obtained by the Ethics Review Committee, Faculty of Medicine, uh, University of Colombo. So the study intervention design was also approved from the research and higher degrees committee of Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. So when we move into the research and discussion section, so no sections or subsections was removed based on this criteria I uh, told you before, and the section and subsections, all the ones are retained, were retained. So however, the content was revised actually based on the expert comments obtained from each section and subsection. So these consensus methods are commonly used when adapting programs for cross culture as well as the scales. So especially in medical and nursing disciplines. Uh, so uh, we have found that in a similar study, a two-rounder Delphi review has been carried out to develop a clinical practice guideline on nursing care of people undergoing cutaneous coronary intervention. So when we move into the conclusions and recommendation, it was noted that the consultation and consensus are very important in developing such protocols and to achieve standardized nursing care. And this health intervention a health counseling intervention protocol is expected to be used uh, in uh, intervention study among the patients with IHD selected hospitals in Gaul district in near future after the pretest. So these are my uh, references. Uh, so uh, all the authors should acknowledge actually the uh, panel of expertise participated in the Nelfi review. So if you treat an individual as he is, he will stay as he is, but if you treat him as he were and he ought to be, and he could be, he will become, he ought to be, and he could be. Thank you very much uh, for listening to the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kumar, uh, for your excellent presentation. Now the paper is open for discussion. Any questions uh, online or from the audience here? Mr. Kumar. Okay. Can you hear me? Online question first. And, yes, uh, yes, madam. I can hear you, madam. Uh, why did you keep that uh, title like uh, starting an intervention? Uh, so it's actually a, develop, a development of a protocol, madam, on the counseling intervention uh, to uh, improve the treatment adherence uh, consisted of- I uh, think uh, you could start it with the uh, development of a protocol on counseling intervention. Okay. Rather than uh, starting like this. This is uh, just like uh, you have done the intervention. But anyway, you, have, you haven't done the intervention, no? No, madam. Still not. Yeah. Okay. Any, uh, yes, your question? Uh, Chandima, thank you for your the great presentation. I have uh, two questions to be asked. The one is, uh, uh, you have done the two rounds of the Delphi techniques. Can you explain uh, your cumulative uh, content validity index for that? Whether they should be improved or not? And uh, the consist with the panels. So how many yes. nurses are involved in that Delphi technique? Yes, uh, in this uh, Delphi technique, actually uh, one was uh, a director level uh, of uh, health educator as also a, a nursing director was involved and also a nurse uh, trainer, health education as a trainer and also in charge. He was also an in charge uh, health, uh, edu uh, of a health education unit in a base hospital. So, uh, so those comments were option and uh, regarding the consensus uh, that we have done, the content variety received its maximum. But uh, however, there are several comments uh, made by the expertise. So we wanted to revise them. Uh, then uh, we have resent them for uh, the consensus. Uh, so then uh, we have uh, reached the maximum level of content variety as a whole. And Finally. the other one is uh, you're planning to uh, implement this for the nurses. Yes. So, how would you how, how would suggest to interpret these things to the nurses before you to practice? Yes, uh, before uh, doing the counseling intervention, we are going to do a pre-test uh, for this uh, intervention. So, so in that, uh, two experts are going to be involved. Uh, so, this uh, with the uh, use of uh, these experts, we can uh, test the, uh, do the test and retest uh, reliability uh, on uh, these uh, coherence values can be. 
uh, obtained and with that uh, we are going to assess this pretest and then we are going to move into the uh, intervention protocol intervention thank you thank you okay uh, i think uh, the absence of other questions we will now move on to our next presentation uh, because of the technical issues we are not following the order Thank However, you. we are trying our best to give, uh, connect with everyone and give chances uh, for the presentations. Now, the fifth uh, presentation on the list is due now. That is on medication practices in the management of upper respiratory tract infections among undergraduates of University of Jaffna, Sri Lanka. The authors are in Anushka, K. Kalki, and B. A. D. Uh, Kunge. They are from the Department of Pharmacy, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, University of Jaffna, and Department of Community and Family Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna. This is a collaboration of both the uh, Allied Health Science Faculty and the Medi Medical Faculty of Jaffna University. The presentation will, uh, is done by in Tanushka, the recorded presentation, and we'll be starting now. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Danushika Nageswara from Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, University of Jaffna, and I'd like to thank each and everyone for the great opportunity to publish my research paper in 14th International Research Conference, General Sir John Kotelawala Defense University. And here I'm going to perform my presentation on medication practices in the management of upper respiratory tract infections among undergraduates of University of Jaffna, Sri Lanka. And here, Introduction of our study, acute upper respiratory tract infections are the acute infections of nose, sinus, pharynx, larynx, epiglottis, and other upper lungs. And it's the most commonly encountered infectious diseases in both pediatric and adult populations. It's accounted for the 20 to 30 percentage of all hospital admissions and 30 to 60 percentage of practitioner visits globally. And the treatment of upper respiratory tract infections may be classified as the symptomatic treatment, complementary and alternative treatment, antibiotic treatment and other practical interventions. The symptomatic treatment is used to relieve the symptoms of upper respiratory tract infections and it includes antipyretics, analgesics, antihistamines, decongestants and expectorants. But this antibiotic treatment in upper respiratory tract infections still remains contentious because more than 90% of the infections are of the viral etiology. And the early antibiotic treatments for the upper respiratory tract infections are not recommended. But if the symptoms are getting worsening, it can be used to treat. And in the most of the circumstances, Circumstances, URTIs are usually self-limiting and numerous over-the-counter medications have no effect on outcome. So this antibiotic abuse and misuse in upper respiratory tract infections may lead to antibiotic resistance bacterial strains, which is the current global crisis throughout the world. And undergraduate students, as they are the educated adult populations, so there's a need to educate about the proper medication usage in upper respiratory tract infections, which may lead to rational usage of medications in near future. Furthermore, this study will help to identify the areas where the undergraduates possess the poor knowledge, and it helps to improve in that particular area. So the objectives of our study, the general objectives to describe the medication practices in the management of upper respiratory tract infections and influence of sociodemographic factors on them among the undergraduates of University of Chesna. The specific objectives is to describe the medication practices 
and to describe the influence of sociodemographic factors on medication practices. The methodology of our study, institutional-based descriptive cross-sectional study was carried out among the second-year undergraduates who were enrolled in 2016-17 and it was conducted from July 2019 to November 2020 and 382 undergraduates were recruited for the study and stratified random sampling method was performed to recruit the participants from a total number of 2,586 second year undergraduates. And data collection was carried out using a self-administered questionnaire. Before the data collection, the pre-test was carried out at University of College of Jaffna and alterations and modifications were done according to the results of the participants and without affecting the objectives of the study. The ethical clearance was obtained from the Ethics Review Committee, Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna and permission for the data collection via email was obtained from the vice chancellor university of jaffna and the deans of respective faculties and data collection was carried out from 27th july 2020 to 26th september 2020 and then the collected data was entered into the statistical package for the social sciences version 23 and analyzed based on the research specific objectives results were presented as the frequency percentage mean median and standard deviations and when we are analyzing the influence of sociodemographic factors on medication practices the chi square test as well as the fisher's exact test were used to analyze those things and the results of our study here 314 participants were responded to our questionnaire as the respondents rate was 82.1 percentage and here among the majority of the participants were female and unmarried 97.1 percentage of them were unmarried which was similar to the previous studies conducted among the Pakistan University students and Thai students. And this pie chart shows the exact percentages of the male and female participants. Furthermore, when we are looking into the distribution of practices among the participants, so, so when we are analyzing how many times did the participant have the URTAs in the past three months, 44.9% of the participants had the URTAs at least once for the last three months and the symptoms that they had during the last episode of the URTAs. So majority, 74.1% of them had the common call followed by the cough, 33.7% and sneezing, 27%. And distribution of practices regarding the symptomatic and alternative treatment of URTS. Majority of the participants, 74.8 percentage, had taken the antipyretics followed by the vitamin C, 73.8 percentage, cough shrubs, and antihistamines as their symptomatic treatment. And here, when considering the alternative treatment or complementary treatment of upper respiratory tract infections, majority of them tried steaming 87.6 percentage, followed by the herbal remedies and gargling with salt water. So distribution of practices regarding the antibiotic usage in upper respiratory tract infections. So more than Half of the participants, majority, 63.7 percentage of them, had taken the antibiotics to treat their symptoms of upper respiratory tract infections. But however, a previous study is conducted in Pakistan University students stated that 79.5 percentage of them took the antibiotics for their URTAs. So this table shows the um, various statements related to the antibiotic usage in upper respiratory tract infections and the frequencies and percentage. 
Here, the 42.0 percentage of the participants got the antibiotics from the pharmacy without the prescriptions for the URTS, and also 71.3 percentage completed their antibiotic course as prescribed by the doctor. 45.5 percentage of them suggested their antibiotics to their friends in similar conditions. And um, some other practices also showed that this study concluded that inappropriate usage of antibiotics among the undergraduate students of the University of Jaffna in the upper respiratory tract infections. And this table also shows the uh, influence of uh, the faculty of the study of the participants to the various statements related to the antibiotic usage. Here also, high scale test was performed to uh, identify the relationship. So majority of the practices have the statistically significant influence by the health science and non-health science students. Furthermore, when we are analyzing the influence of social demographic factors on practices regarding completing the antibiotic course, only faculty of the participant had statistically significant influence on completing the antibiotic course as prescribed by the doctor. When comparing to the non-health science students, health science students had completed their antibiotic course as prescribed by the doctor. And furthermore, our study concluded that irrational usage of antibiotics for the upper respiratory tract infection was observed among the undergraduates of the University of Jaffna, irrespective of faculty of the study. And also, this suggested that educational programs should be designed to educate the undergraduate students about the significance of antibiotic treatment course, antibiotic resistance, and other proper medication usage, irrespective of faculty of study. And relevant legislation should be implemented in Sri Lankan pharmacies regarding the purchase of antibiotics without prescriptions and dispensing antibiotics as prescription only medicine. These are the references of our study. So that's all about my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sanushka. I don't know whether you are available uh, online for a discussion. Are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, can, can, can you hear? Okay. Right. So the paper is now open for discussion. Uh, yeah, can you tell me? Yes, madam. Can you tell us more about your data collection instrument? Uh, my instrument is a self-administered questionnaire, and I, due to the pandemic situation, so I use the Google Forms uh, through the email, and I obtain the consent from the participants by sending the consent form before, and after obtaining the consent, I send the uh, uh, questionnaire to the particular participant and collect the uh, uh, question uh, answers from them. Thank you. Uh, research group developed the questionnaire or you borrowed it from somewhere? Um, uh, most of the questions are from some of the literatures and uh, some of the questions I modified according to the Sri Lankan context. Thank you. Now, uh, you. Ms. Tamashika. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, how can you justify your study population? Uh, study population. So I here I uh, selected the second year undergraduates because first year students are newly to the particular course and they are new newly to the uh, environment. And furthermore, the some of the courses third year students are the final year students and final year students are busy with their research works and some are going for the industrial training. So I selected second year undergraduates to detect the differences between the faculties. So that's why I selected this particular population. Compared to the community? Uh, compared to the community, so so as I was an undergraduate, so I faced a lot of upper respiratory tract infections, usually come and call the cup, and it may affect the uh, students more. So I selected uh, undergraduates. 
Anushka, you uh, conducted the study from March, uh, from July 2019 to November 2020. Yes. You know that whether there were any COVID positive patients among these. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, I, I think there's no COVID positive patients, uh, undergraduates. Okay. Any questions? Any further questions? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anushka, your excellent presentation. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, we will move on to our last presentation of the session, which is actually the first one listed. We could not continue with that. Now I think the technical matters are sorted. Not sorted. So we are not going to record it. So we will move on to a recorded version of the first presentation. That is quality of life and its related factors among patients with stroke and selected tertiary care hospitals in Sri Lanka. Uh, so there are authors, uh, L K M E W S M U L Lepola. K N Nadisha, E R A I Jay Vikrama, W M A I J Sundara, R D N Karunathilaka, and M M P T Jay Sekar. So this uh, again uh, study. These authors belong to the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences at uh, Patlal Defence University, and also uh, Faculty of Medicine, Patlal Defence University. The presenter will be L K M E W S M U L A Polar, and it's a recorded presentation because of the technical issues we faced earlier. Okay, we'll start the. Presentation. Thank you, K D U I R C, for giving this valuable opportunity for us. I'm Sachin L A Polar from General Sir John Kothalavala Defence University. Our study is in quality of life and its related factors. In among patients with stroke in selected tertiary care hospitals in Sri Lanka. When we were working in the medical wards, we saw that in stroke patients' quality of life have been limited. So during that time, we needed to find the factors that affected for quality of life. Because as healthcare professionals, it's valuable to get to know about quality of life of stroke patients and related factors when caring for the patient. If we know these things, we can give a better care for the patient. So, when reading about it, we came to know that there were limited evidences were available in Sri Lanka. So, later we decided to conduct a study in that field. WHO defines stroke as a rapidly developed clinical signs of focal disturbance of cerebral function lasting more than 24 hours or leading to death with no apparent cause other than of vascular origin. Incidence of stroke significantly decreased by 12% in high income countries and increased by 12% in low income and middle income countries. Stroke is now the second leading cause of mortality and the third leading cause of disability globally. Stroke is the leading cause of disability among adults in Sri Lanka. Quality of life has been demarcated as an individual's perceptions of their position in life in the context of the culture and the value system in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards and concerns. Quality of life of a patient with stroke is a vital factor to be measured since cognitive functions of such patient will rigorously collapse. Stroke causes a significant worsening of the patient's functioning and deteriorating of his or her quality of life and long-term disability. We conducted a descriptive cross-sectional study at first, we selected five tertiary care hospitals in Sri Lanka by using convenient sampling method. Colombo South Teaching Hospital, Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Provincial General Hospital, Kurunagala, Teaching Hospital, Anuradhapura, 
and University Hospital KDU were the hospitals we selected. For data collections, we selected an acute stroke patient within seven days of diagnosis of disease condition. In here, we selected ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke patients excluding transient ischemic attack. Accordingly, we selected 134 stroke patients by using convenient sampling method. For data collections, we used two questionnaires. First one is in short form 36. It contains eight domains including physical functioning domain, role limitation physical domain, bodily pain domain, general health domain, vitality domain, social functioning domain, role limitation emotional domain, and mental health domain. Maximum score of each domain is 100 and minimum score is 0. Higher the subdomain score of SF36 indicating higher the level of quality of life. Our second questionnaire was demographic data and disease specific questionnaire. It included age, gender, comorbidities, power grade of limbs, disability of limbs, stroke associated behavioral factors and etc. Those two questionnaires used as interviewer administered questionnaires. For data analysis, we used SPSS statistical package version 20. Accordingly, we performed a frequency analysis and calculated percentages, mean and SD values. Then performed bivariate analysis and finally performed multiple linear regression to find out associated factors. According to our result findings, majority of the patients were male and mean age was 65.4 years. Majority of them were married. Higher number of patients were single. Majority of patients were affected with ischemic stroke. When considering about comorbidities, Majority of the patients were affected with diabetic mellitus and hypertension. Minority of patients were affected with ischemic heart disease, dyslipidemia and chronic kidney disease. When considering about disability of both upper limb and lower limb, around half of the patients were affected with left side followed by the right side. Nearly around one-fourth of the patients were affected with both sides. In SF36, maximum score was 100 and minimum score was 0. Accordingly, highest mean score was 60 for mental health domain and lowest mean score was 21.9 for physical functioning domain. Physical functioning domain, role limitation physical domain, role limitation emotional domain and general health domain having main scores below average score 50. Bodily pain domain, vitality domain, social functioning domain and mental health domain having main scores above average score 50. Multiple linear regression was revealed that in physical functioning domain, aphasia, disability of lower limb, dysarthria, caregiver and dyslipidemia were the predictors of quality of life and 28.4% was explained by the observed variable. In bodily pain domain, Aphasia and disability of vision were the predictors of quality of life and 22% was explained by the observed variables. In general health domain, disability of face, caregiver and current passive smoking status were the predictors of quality of life 
and 21.4 percentage was explained by the observed variables. In vitality domain, aphasia and disability of face were the predictors of quality of life and 22.7 percentage was explained by the observed variables. In social functioning domain, aphasia, type of stroke, alcohol consumption and disability of face were the predictors of quality of life and 24.8 percentage was explained by the observed variables. In role limitation emotional domain, disability of face and geographical area were the predictors of quality of life and 37.5 percentage was explained by the observed variables. In mental health domain, aphasia, monthly income and disability of face were the predictors of quality of life and 65.4 percentage was explained by the observed variables. As stated, the constant significant results for role limitation physical domain, the value is greater than 0.05. Therefore, role limitation physical domain was rejected. Discussion Present study revealed that hypertension and diabetic mellitus are the common medical comorbidities among stroke patients. Previous studies also revealed that majority of patients had pre-existing diabetic mellitus and hypertension. And also current study revealed that physical functioning, physical role limitation, emotional role limitation and general health domains mean scores were less than average and score, scores of other domains mean scores were higher than average score. Previous studies also concluded that at one month after stroke mean scores, physical functioning, physical role limitation, vitality, social functioning and emotional role limitation domains mean scores were less than average score and other domains mean scores were higher than average score. Conclusion Physical functioning domain, role limitation physical domain, general health domain and role limitation emotional domain having lesser scores than average score while social functioning domain, vitality domain, bodily pain domain and mental health domain having higher scores than average score. Aphasia, disability of face, disability of lower limb, disability of vision, dysarthria, dyslipidemia, smoking status, alcohol consumption, geographical area, monthly income, type of stroke and caregiver were the factors associated with quality of life. Therefore, awareness of these related factors and awareness of maximum and minimum scores of each domains may be helpful to improve quality of life of patients with stroke and helpful for healthcare professionals to plan early interventions. These are our references. We acknowledge all the stroke patients who participated in this study. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lebole. And uh, are you there with us uh, for a yes. yes, sir. Okay. Now the paper is open for questions. Any questions uh, from online or from the audience here? Uh, it's from where you uh, recruited patients uh, from Kalambu North Teaching Hospital? From which wards? Uh, medical wards, madam. Which means you haven't think about the stroke unit to have uh, Madam, we needed the patients uh, who diagnosed the disease condition within seven days. Hmm? 
so within seven days these patients were in medical wards in ragama um, we selected patients from stroke unit uh, in other hospitals medical wards thank you any other questions uh... Okay, then in the absence of uh, questions, uh, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Alebola, for uh, the detailed presentation. We are sorry about the technical difficulties we faced, uh, but at the end, uh, we managed to do all six presentations. Thank, thank you, sir. Now, uh, with that, uh, I will make my final remarks to conclude the, the session, uh, the nursing session one, I think, yes. And uh, first of all, I must thank uh, everyone involved. Uh, that includes uh, the Vice Chancellor of KDU as well as the organizing committee uh, to having this uh, KDU IRC for 14 consecutive time, even with all the difficulties that we face all over the world. So this is an uninterrupted uh, 14th uh, time. Last time also we had a hybrid uh, conference. And I must thank all the authors, the investigators who uh, submitted uh, these abstracts and uh, consented to present uh, today, either online or recorded versions so or in person here. Without your submissions, uh, we would never be able to have a, a session like this. So although we face few technical difficulties, I, I consider this as a very successful session. And what is important is, uh, as it truly mentioned, it is not just KDU session. If you look at uh, the, the six presentations, perhaps the six presentations may be from six different institutes, both in the universities as well as from health ministry hospitals. So there were ones from Purunagal Hospital and Badulla Hospital. And, and, and from universities all over the country, including Jaffna, in Colombo, Sri Jayadhanapura, as well as Patalavala, Defense University. So this is a, a, a true national uh, type of uh, conference. And I, I hope and I encourage uh, the organizers uh, by next time, we will get uh, abstracts from other countries also and to make it a, a real international conference. So, and also uh, the areas that you have studied were very important and interesting. Now, many of us as clinicians, as healthcare workers, we just want to diagnose and treat the conditions, but there are certain hidden factors that are contributing immensely to the final outcome. And, and some of the, the researchers presented here today were focusing on them. For example, factors, other factors associated with the outcome of uh, hemodialysis, and also factors associated with manage, long-term management of thalassemia. So, and also the, the final one that we just listened about the, the factors affecting the quality of life of strokes. So, so likewise, all the topics that you were selected were very important in the healthcare um, management. And, 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 and there, some of these are hidden factors that we don't normally consider uh, most of the time. So I must thank you for selecting those topics also. And also for the, the young researchers who presented today, I want to tell you that 
uh, the comments that we made and the questions we asked was for the purpose of improvement. And you should not stop from here. You have to go ahead and make these presentations a paper publication in a reputed journal. So the comments we made today, both by me and all the people who asked questions, especially uh, the judges who asked the questions, were to improve your, your uh, research. So take those also into consideration when you write the final journal. Your task is not fulfilled until your research come out as a journal article in a peer review journal. So continue to work hard and present all these six journals, uh, presentations in, a, uh, in, in journals as research articles. And we also have now from this year, we have a multi-specialty research journal in KDU. Please consider that as well when you uh, decide on the journals to be submitted. With that remark, I'll wish you all the best and, uh, and I'll, I'll wish you to do more and more research. And also during this difficult period, please stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Now we have come into the end of the presentations and the questions and answers session. And now we are commencing the Memento Awarding Ceremony. Now I cordially invite the chairperson of the session, Professor Namal Vijay Singha, to award the mementos to the judges of the session. So I would like to invite Dr. Tamara Amrasekara to receive her memento of appreciation. However, since she joined with us online, I would like to invite Ms. Niroshini Seniviratna to receive the memento on behalf of her. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Lalita Migoda to receive her memento of appreciation. However, she is also joined with us online. Therefore, I would like to invite Ms. Udeshika Sugatapala to receive the memento on behalf of her. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sugatapala. Thank you, sir. I cordially invite Dr. Darshana Kotihachi, Dean, Dean of Faculty of Health Sciences of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University to offer the memento in appreciation of the chairperson of the session, Professor Namal Vijay Singha. Thank you, everyone.